This is Twit. I want to turn the attention to uh, a topic, Jonathan, that, that you raised. There was a, a new law uh, that was signed, uh, Vladimir Putin signed it earlier this month, that really cracks down on online speech. Jonathan, why don't you unpack that a little bit for us and tell us what's going on over there in Russia with, with online speech. Sure. Yeah, there was a, a new law passed. It was uh, in early May in Russia that requires um, online voices. So these are bloggers uh, to register with the government. And that would give, of course, you know, the government a really wide ability you know, to track who says what online. Um, and in, in a broad sense, what this does is borrow a page from you know the playbooks of places like China, uh, places like you know Turkey, Egypt, uh, that have you know long restricted uh, access to the internet and have long restricted particular types of content uh, that's available on the internet. Um, it's colloquially called the blogger's law, and uh, basically it specifies that any site with more than three thousand visitors daily uh, will be considered a media outlet in Russia. Uh, akin to a newspaper and that therefore it's going to be responsible uh, for the accuracy of the information published. Um, in addition, the law tells bloggers that they may not remain anonymous. Uh, and so organizations that provide platforms for their work, you know, like search engines, um, uh, they have to maintain you know, computer records on Russian soil of everything posted over the previous six months. As a number of critics have pointed out, you know, the law, it, it's, it's very likely to cut the number of critical voices and you know, the number of opposition voices. It, at least it will mute those voices. Um, and then around the same time, he, uh, Putin signed a, another law, uh, separate but related, uh, insofar as it stands to restrict speech. Uh, but this is both offline and online. Uh, and it heavies uh, or it levies uh, heavy fines for using, you know, common four letter vulgarities uh, in the arts. And that would include literature, movies, plays, TV, any of those distributed online or off. Um, a few months before these developments, there was another law passed in Russia that gave the government the power to block websites. And um, it, what Putin did, he his his government immediately used that against uh, many of the the most vocal critics, and you know all of this is done against a backdrop of uh, Pew polls, you know Pew Research polls uh, that have been conducted recently, showing that uh, roughly you know it, it's well over fifty percent of. Um, uh, people in in Russia and around the world, and even in other uh, authoritarian nations like Turkey, uh, that the vast majority of their citizens support uh, free speech and uh, oppose government censorship of the internet. Um, and so, when I look at this, I think that you know this is the problem of, of government restrictions, certainly. But I think it's important to consider these issues using um, a wider lens to include private restrictions on content too. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, to borrow a phrase from Rebecca McKinnon, the Internet scholar, uh, you know, the sovereigns of cyberspace like Google, Facebook, Twitter, and so on, they're writing the current chapter in the story of free speech. Um, they're conducting private worldwide speech regulation, and they're doing so by writing, um, interpreting, enforcing their own edicts about what type of content is permissible and impermissible uh, on their platforms. Um, in, in doing that, what they're really doing is developing a de facto free speech jurisprudence. And that's a significant development here because of the tremendous power of those companies and, and private platforms to shape public discourse. And so, you know, online communication is going to continue to prolifer uh, proliferate and the platforms enab enabling that, they're, they're trying to be flexible, I think, so that they can strike you know, what they would consider to be the proper balance among democratic values, legal obligations, and business interest. And to put it another way, this is the way that you know, Jonathan Zittrain put it from Harvard. He said that um, companies are benevolent rulers uh, trying to approximate you know, the kinds of decisions they think would be uh, respectful of, of free speech as a value, but also of, of human safety. Um, and so, you know, companies that are based in the United States, Google, Facebook, Twitter, and so on, they, they enjoy a First Amendment freedom of speech that encompasses the right to make their own policies regarding what type of speech they host. 
Um, and you know, because they're private rather than government actors, you know, seemingly they're not constrained by the First Amendment. You know, they can set whatever rules they want. Um, and they also are bound to comply with the local laws of every country where they operate. Otherwise, they could create some serious potential liability. So, you know, one of one of the outstanding issues here with regard to the to the Russian uh, bloggers law is, you know, will large international social media or search companies like Google, like Twitter, like Facebook, will they really have to keep their data, you know, in Russian databases or face fines and, and possible uh, closures? Um, you know, I, I don't know. That's not clear from the face of the law. Um, and if, if you take more broadly, you know, the issue of private companies operating as arbiters of free speech in a global scale, I think that you would find no better example of that than um, it would have been not this last fall, but the fall before uh, in 2013. Uh, or 12, rather, uh, the Innocence of, of Muslims video that was posted uh, on YouTube a couple of times by the same person. And, you know, it the it's a very long, involved story, but, you know, the short story is that um, there was a man who developed a screenplay uh, for what turned out to be the Innocence of Muslims video. And the original screenplay focused on the life on life in Egypt uh, more than 2,000 years ago. But in editing, the trailer was, was edited and overdubbed to basically dramatize the life of Muhammad. And it incorporated scenes based on slurs about him that are often you know, repeated by, by uh, people who you, know, you might characterize as Islamophobic. And the clip was clearly designed to offend Muslims. Um, you know, when the New York Times reported on it, you know, they they basically you know said that the trailer opens with with scenes of Egyptian security forces standing idle you know as Muslims pillage and burn the homes of Egyptian Christians and and so on and so forth and you know it it uh, depicted the Prophet Muhammad as a child of uncertain parentage a buffoon a womanizer and, and many other you know, terrible things um, this created a really interesting problem for Google the parent company of YouTube which again was hosting uh, the the video. Um, there were protests raging in the Middle East at the time, you know, flaring in Yemen, Nigeria, Iran, Jordan. Um, as they flared, you know, Google began acting as an arbiter of free speech, uh, restricting access to the video here, leaving it unrestricted there, you know, all while performing you know, a delicate balance that normally is performed by courts uh, in these areas. And Google ended up blocking access to the video in Egypt and, and Libya, citing the very difficult situation in those countries. You know, there was a lot of violence raging in those countries then. Um, some of it connected with the video, some of it not. And in other parts of the world, Google blocked access to instances of, of Muslims where the video, either on its face or by, by inciting riotous behavior, it violated local laws. Uh, so again, you know, I, th I think that when you when you consider the effects of of any restriction on online speech, you have to consider the wider lens because I think in an ideal world, we would have a single global internet and we would have a governance structure that would reflect it. And when individual countries do things like Russia did with its bloggers law, you create these really small jurisdictional silos. Uh, where you're basically cordoning off you know, your network from you know, freer networks around the world.